for Chef Ian. Thank you for being here. Hey, thank you for being here. Attending, coming to Kitchen Metamorphosis, Edible Insects. Uh, it really is a, an honor to be here uh, at ATF presenting something for you chefs. So uh, thank you all for coming and uh, let's get started. Um, how many of you have tried eating edible insects before? Okay, I am in some good company. <laughs> that feels good, guys. All right. Happy to know. So in this presentation, we're gonna talk about edible insects. Insect agriculture. How many of you have heard of this term before? Yeah, relatively new. You think agriculture, you think insects are pests and something of that are against good agricultural practices, but we're gonna get into why insect agriculture is so important. Sustainability, philosophy, a little bit about yours truly, gastronomy, and the path forward. The following pictures in this presentation are all of my food, journals, media, and events that I've been covering for Combugs. And uh, it is really an incredibly exciting time for entomophagy or eating insects. And I will even go as far as to say that the world has collectively never spoken more about eating insects than at this very present moment. A really important part of this is that edible insects are not just for humans, but importantly, also applicable for insect agriculture, which we will get into later on. It is going to be essential for us to reimagine what edible insects can look like gastronomically. All too often people think of them as like a whole bowl full of crickets or something, but really how we can, as chefs, Reimagine this food is going to be essential for us to be able to incorporate insects and adopt them into our lifestyle. So for all of you that have already tried eating insects, you're in good company because 80% of the world's nations and over 2 billion people regularly consume insects on a regular basis. So this is what really started the great interest in the Western world on edible insects is this UN uh, file report, the Food and Agricultural Organization, Edible Insects, Future Prospects for Food and Feed Security. In this report, they talk about the world's burgeoning population in 2050. How are we gonna sustainably feed the population? And this is not a silver bullet solution, but it's among the portfolio of solutions that we can adopt to address food security, sustainability, environmentalism, and livelihood. So every two years, I'm really happy to say that we are hosting the Insects to Feed the World Conference. This is a conference uh, just last year, and I'm here with Dr. Arnold Van House, who is the main author of the UN's FAO report. And I feel so incredibly fortunate to travel around the world, speaking at universities, museums, and conferences, sharing the ideas of eating insects and insect agriculture and the impact that it can have on our global food systems. I actually flew here directly from Bangkok where I was working with Pasasar University and also APIA, which is the Asian Food and Feed Insect Association. And so I came here straight from Bangkok, not a flight that I would necessarily recommend, uh, but so happy to be here. And really interestingly, I will be on all continents except for Antarctica in a year's time uh, sharing my work. So as I travel around, I like to ask uh, a couple questions for your consideration and thought. One, can eating insects actually save the planet? And that might sound like a really preposterous question, but let's uh, dive into it a little bit and we'll see how, uh, how we get around to even this sort of idea. And two, another question I like to ask, what impact can eating insects and insect agriculture have on global food systems? 
So before I dive into all that, just to let you guys know, I have always been a big lover of food. It's been a really big part of my family life. And uh, as with a lot of cultures, I'm sure some, some of you may be aware, but uh, a lot of Koreans, we show love by, by sharing food. And so my mom, she'd be like, son, you're getting a little heavy in weight. Oh, eat some more food. Uh, I don't know if any of your moms also say the same thing, but we're always trying to eat a lot of food, but I've learned so much and I'm so grateful to my family uh, for really inspiring me and, and kind of uh, for me being here really at the end of the day. So I started Brooklyn Bugs in 2017 with a mission to normalize edible insects. And we break down psychological barriers and transform perceptions in sustainability through an interdisciplinary approach rooted in advocacy, outreach, education, and gastronomy. And in the six years since I've started Brooklyn Bugs, my life has changed so dramatically. Prior to that, I was working as a private chef and caterer, and I never would have imagined that I would be touring around the world doing what I'm doing and speaking like I am right now. And I found a tremendous purpose and motivation and inspiration with this whole idea of insect agriculture. I am so full of gratitude to share what we have been doing with a global audience. And I really emphasize we because while I am on a lot of the media there's an entire industry, so much science and academia that support the work I'm doing. It really is a collective effort. And so when you hear me talking in a plural form, I'm not going crazy, I'm not bugging out. Uh, it's because there's a lot of people that, a lot of stakeholders that I represent in the work that I'm doing. And it's also really important for me to emphasize why I didn't choose to identify as an insect chef but I really thought it was important for someone to be an advocate and to be a resource. And so I immediately, I was like, I'm an edible insect ambassador. I want chefs to be able to approach me, to be accessible. I have questions, how did you do this? And like, I really want to be a resource. And so that's why I chose edible insect ambassador as how I identify. And so you, I, you guys are probably wondering, what is insect agriculture? Like, what's this big idea? And so let's start unpacking this idea of insect agriculture. And I didn't want to show organic waste management, so I'll just keep showing pictures of my food. But we can take black soldier fly larvae and feed them organic waste, restaurant scraps from breweries and bakeries. And we have already passed legislation in both America and the EU to begin feeding these larvae to our livestock. Actually, that's in my next slide. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the circular and regenerative aspects of insect agriculture. Because edible insects are not just for humans, but we can also use it for animal feed, for aquaculture, for chicken, for pet food, and we could decrease the deforestation in the Amazon from all the, the, the forests, that, the rainforests that we're raising for soy and livestock feed. Does anyone here know what the word frass is? So again, I'm, I'm, instead of using a picture of insect poop, which is what frass is, if we're creating metric tons of insects, for both human consumption and animal consumption, we're gonna have all this byproduct. It just so happens that it is an incredibly efficient bio-organic fertilizer, mitigating the chemicals in our waste streams from traditional fertilizers as well. So you guys can start seeing this whole circular nature of the potential of, of edible in or insect agriculture, and why are edible insects considered sustainable because they take a fraction of the resources in the amount of land that's required, the amount of water, the amount of feed, the feed to food conversion is much higher than traditional livestock, and they produce only a fraction of the greenhouse gas emissions compared to traditional livestock. However, 
I cannot expect a single person to go like, okay, I'm going to eat bugs because they're sustainable. That is not going to happen. We have to make it delicious in order to expect people to have any sort of behavioral change and accept it into their diets. So instead of thinking that I want to take away your meat, which is a common trope or idea that people think, we're trying to add something to your diet to diversify it with a nutrient-dense, delicious, and sustainable form of protein. And so what I really love is that Ethel Insects really captures people's imagination and interest, and we're able to root this down in insect agriculture and connect these ideas with far bigger ideas in global food systems. And a lot of times people are like, so what's the best way for us to start eating insects? Like, What's the bug that will get everyone to eat it? It is not that simple. We're talking about this complex interdisciplinary calculus to try to get a global mindset to change around accepting something that's traditionally seen with like a little bit of disgust, more or less to take that and put it into your mouth. And so I feel so incredibly fortunate to work with all these incredible universities and museums and institutions that have been giving presentations, received grants, and this interest has been really fascinating because, as Lindsay said in the, in the intro, most of my funding comes from universities, and we get so much support from that, from that area, but it's really important for us to be able to work with chefs. Because if we're talking about eating insects, we're going to need the help of chefs, and that's why I am so grateful to be here to share this work with you guys. The industry is expanding and explosive right now. We have two companies that have raised over half a billion dollars in, in, with, with in insect agriculture. We have dozens that have raised over $10 million. And so this is a really explosive industry that is growing and we really need more chefs to get on board to help us with these ideas. And again, I don't mean to beat this over the head, but we really do need you guys to help normalize these ideas. And I would love to gain some of your interest in even like considering to R&D it or just trying to work with these insects. Because we need every single academic and culinary discipline to get involved when we're starting this new industry, we need people that work in marketing and business. We need engineers to design these like state-of-the-art vertical indoor insect farms. If you're talking about insect farming, not going out and foraging, because then we would ruin the ecosystems. We're talking about creating these like incredible state-of-the-art 21st century insect farms. One of them, Aspire Food Group, is up in Ontario, Canada. 17 million data points every single day at this farm. Water, humidity, temperature, brands of food, pH level. It is really fascinating what we're experiencing in this industry. So you guys may be wondering what has been the public reaction. It's largely been good, I would say. We, we've been going around sharing 10, 12 course tastings for thousands of people at these external events working with universities or museums, but of course there are going to be some people that are uh, not so favorable about this idea. But you know what's really important? I don't really need you to like me or my food. I don't mean to be snooty saying this, but it's because this work in edible insects and insect agriculture is so much bigger than me, so much bigger than Brooklyn Bob's and the importance of the work that we're doing, that's what's really important. And so what's really interesting in my sort of, it, it, it really is palpable to think that we are living in a moment right now where we are historically defining insect agriculture for humanity. And so I'm tremendously grateful for all the press 
It helps to change public opinion and better inform people about what it is around eating insects. And so if you can see here, uh, Tampa Bay Times, Get Edible Insects Save the Planet, the chef makes a compelling pit case. I really want to emphasize and encourage you guys to dream the impossible, because I never would have thought that this is where I'd be at this present moment. In 2022, I mentioned that we had the uh, Insects to Feed the World Conference. We had 600 participants representing 58 countries, and in 2024, we'll be hosting the next conference in Singapore. I feel very honored to be the chef advocate for EFAD, the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And one of the things that I really love about them is that all too often when you're talking about climate change, it's like these stories of catastrophe or like, climate change is coming, you have to eat the bugs, and no one wants to hear that. That's not a way to entice people. And what I love is that we share these stories through the prism of great hope and optimism and being able to celebrate instead of trying to instill fear on people as a way to like convince them to consider eating insects. And I really love to amplify EFAD's mission and mandate with the visibility I have, so I'm grateful to be able to share a little bit about what they do and really the importance of small rural farmers and stakeholders 30% of all the food in the world is produced by small stakeholders and farmers, 80% in Africa. And so we really can't forget or leave behind those, uh, the smaller farmers. And so I just really love that EFAD go to the areas in greatest need where uh, no one else is really going. And so I, I really love the work that EFAD are, are doing. And uh, last year I was at COP27. It's the UN Climate Change Conference, and uh, I was able to speak four times there to talk about the whole idea of insect agriculture and eating insects. I'm also the uh, culinary advisor to the Methuselah Foundation in support of NASA's Deep Space Food Challenge. And for some of you that might be like, space travel, what, what's that have to do with my work or with like food security? Is it like a billionaire tech race? Like what, what is space? have anything to do with my work or why should we care? And I think that one of the really important things to consider and what really drew me to working on space programs and these ideas is that there are tremendous terrestrial applications that we can use with space technology to address food security, to be able to go into like food deserts and also in areas of natural disaster, and so there's like a tremendous value in the technology that we can develop for space. And so that's where my greatest area of interest is in working around programs like that. Uh, when I was recently in Thailand and also in conversations I've had in, in Africa and Mexico, areas where you think of people that have traditionally eaten a lot of insects, a lot of them are sadly moving away from this practice and culture because of globalization, Americans aren't eating insects. And they're trying to emulate some of this Anglo-Western culture, and so we're seeing negative effects of that. There are children in Africa that are becoming, uh, facing malnutrition because they were once eating insects that were giving them the protein and minerals that they needed. And so I'm trying to find ways for them to embrace this rich and beautiful heritage of eating insects again. And that can really come by providing the culinary services and solutions that we can provide to really be part of changing the global perception and really giving them the sense of pride to, in, to embrace this uh, practice of eating insects again. And so we share facts and science driven by storytelling with vision, purpose, and kindness. And it's really important to note that science is not static and we're always looking for empirical data to update all the information we have because the science of eating insects, even though we've been eating insects since the beginning of human evolution, 
is still relatively new. So we're still finding new data, and there's stuff that I was saying six years ago that we found new data. And so this is something that I really like to emphasize. It's not like what we say today, like we're not ready to like make revisions based on the science that we're finding, to learn and constantly update what we know about the practice and the science around eating insects. So if you guys are wondering like, okay, so what, what problems are, is this truly solving, this idea of eating insects? On the health and nutritional side of things, Crickets, as one example of an insect, they have all nine essential amino acids. And so for those of you that, uh, essential amino acids are amino acids that we need to grow for our body to grow, that we don't naturally produce ourselves, that we need to intake from outside of our, uh, from an outside part of our diet. And so it's incredible that crickets have all nine essential amino acids, 60 to 80% protein by weight, low in fat, low in carbs, and also have different vitamins and minerals like vitamin B12. And so it is a really smart and nutritious food. On the sustainability side, we already talked about that. But one of the things that I want to emphasize, because all too often people think, oh, what, are we going to eat insects like every day? But no, even if 10% of us were to eat insects just once a week, kind of like Meatless Monday, even that would have a tremendous impact on, on our environment. And on the food security side, one of the really big, I think, questions that, that come up for me in, in discussions um, at the UN or different sort of places around global food systems is the food security side. We're looking at having these like massive farms to create metric tons of, in, of insect protein. But what about like the one bucket solution? Is there a way that we could provide a bucket for a family to help supplement their diet in parts of the developing world? And these are all parts of what we're exploring right now and trying to come up with better solutions, utilizing technology that we're developing in other areas so that we can address areas and be able to positively impact food security in parts of the world. The workforce activation and livelihood is like a really big aspect because our industry is exploding with tens of thousands of new jobs right now. And so for people that were interested in maybe entomology with limited sort of job potential, that might be in entomology and academia, maybe in pest management, now we have this whole beautiful new industry to explore the potential and also for chefs that are out there that are interested in exploring these like sort of new ideas that's also a great potential to be able to join the ento revolution and so there really tremendously is unlimited potential between edible insects and insect agriculture so Let's get into a little bit of gastronomy, shall we? We are at ACF, after all. How many edible insects do you guys think there are? Uh, under 500, let's see a quick show of hands. Under 500 edible insect species. Over 500. Okay, none of you went for the under 500. Over 1,000, do I have over 1,000? Over 1,000, over 1,000. Okay, over 2,000. Okay, whoever's hand is still up. There are over 2,000 species of edible insects with wildly different flavor profiles, textures, and functionality. So when people are like, I just can't, that texture chef. I'm like, which texture are you talking about? Crunchy, squishy, or everything in between? Because that's what edible insects are. So it's, how many chefs do you guys know that's like, I don't like to learn anything new or try any new ingredients. That's like, the, like every chef I know is like, oh wow, that's a new fruit, I wanna try it. That's like one of the great joys of traveling for me, I get to try new foods. And so imagine having this playground of 2,000 new flavors and new ingredients to work with. And so it's really important to have fun and enjoy yourself. 
And what I love is that insides can truly enhance and improve the nutrition, texture, and flavor of your food. Um, these super worms that are here, they actually taste cheesy, if you can believe it. Uh, black ants have formic acid, which give it an acidic flavor profile. And so it's really amazing. It's, a lot of times nutty is a common flavor profile used to describe insects, but there are so many different flavors with insects. Have you guys ever thought about why it's okay to eat mold? Cheese, right? Fungus, mushrooms, bacteria, lack of fermentation. We're eating sea bugs. We got uh, lobster, crabs, shrimp, they're all arthropods, just like insects, right? And also, I'm pretty sure all of you guys have tried some insect vomit. Honey. Honey. Right. So what's so weird about eating edible insects if we're willing to eat insect regurgitation? <laughs> so the only limitation we have in cooking with insects is our own imagination. I have literally cooked every single type of meal, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, snacks, late night snacks. And it is so fun to think about how I can bugify a pre-existing dish. Cuisines, limitless. Any type of cuisine, if you guys name a dish, I love to bugify those dishes. And so these are just examples of like, that's why I wanted to show a lot of different pictures in my presentation give you an idea of like the different types of like dishes that we can make with insect protein. But eating insects does not have to be all the things because sometimes people are like, oh, it's really nutritious. So why are you gonna put it into a donut? Uh, why not? Because I like donuts. Uh, I love to fulfill guilty pleasures as well. It's not like just because you have I mean, think about all the desserts we make with fruit and everything, right? I mean, it's like we can use insects for so much. And you can also highlight the insect like the cicada here, those uh, sauteed in garlic and aromatics, or you can hide it like I did with this cricket green goddess sauce here as well. So there's no right or wrong as far as like showing insects or hiding insects when, when we serve it. <coughs> One of my favorite all-time applications is with insect kimchi, and I utilize the cricket powder for the umami instead of utilizing oysters or fish sauce or something like that. I'm able to use cricket powder as a substitute and also as a substitute for the glutinous rice flour. So I'm able to use uh, cricket powder for both of those functionalities. And so I love to just demonstrate a wide range of applications to give you a better idea of ways that you can incorporate edible insects. This is a video that shows uh, how to eat every edible insect. Obviously, I didn't do 2,000, but we thought it was just a cute way to grab people's attention. But it is a 20-minute video uh, going through cooking edible insects. And the cultural integration and working with influencers are really integral to the normalization of eating insects. And I'm looking at you guys also be able to help with this. And if you do take some pictures or something, feel free to tag me, share with your friends, just kind of, it helps to get the idea out there. And really each opportunity helps us to reach new audiences. And so I try to make myself as available as possible to, to be a part of a lot of different programming uh, opportunities to share my work around eating insects. Um, as you can imagine, I definitely get trolled a fair amount for the work that I'm doing. Uh, people have gone so far as to curse at my face and kind of, uh, they, they get really triggered. And one of the things that I love is that um, I don't get bothered by it because I literally understand how people can feel that way. They don't know about it. It's like this new idea, and for some people, they feel threatened by these new ideas. It's neophobia, the fear of new ideas. And so I'd love to be able to show kindness and genuinely be like, I understand. 
If you would like to know some more, I'm happy to share more about my work with you. And when I was first approached to appear on Fox, they, they spoke in really um, poorly about this idea of eating insects. And I love that this work is so apolitical. This is not a liberal or a conservative thing or anything like that. And I truly, genuinely believe in food justice. And to be able to address food security and environmentalism and, and these things, the care and stewardship for next, the next future generations should not be political. And so even though there's been some negative talk about it prior, uh, this was actually a really, a, a pretty good interview actually, I have to say. And so again, our focus is really rooted in advocacy, outreach, and education. And it's really key to changing minds and creating behavioral change through education. And we're so happy to work with kids of all ages. We have a, a modular curriculum that's, uh, um, that was uh, in part fun uh, funded by the US Department of Education. We're working with the New York City Department of Education and a lot of universities, and it's really fundamental for us to be able to help instill these ideas of normalcy and really presenting it just simply as like a delicious food source. And so our approach is to transform this fear through education, knowledge, empathy, and understanding. We are booking for the academic school year, and so if any of you are in, uh, educators, I'm more than happy to talk to you guys about, uh, about working with your school. Collaboration is really at the very heart of what we are doing at Brooklyn Bugs. So if I can be of assistance to you guys, either at your restaurant or at your school, uh, I really welcome you guys to get in contact with me. And seriously, I don't mean to keep beating a, a, you know, this over your heads, but we really do need, desperately need chefs, uh, both young chefs who are interested in learning about this, or maybe you're a more experienced chef and you're tired of working on the line, and it's like, wow, I'm really beat up. I could work on something that's more administratively orientated. That also is a possibility. We have so much opportunity in this uh, in this industry right now. So, can we positively impact the world? I truly believe that everyone can be a change maker, and it really starts on a local or regional basis. So, believe in yourself. Have faith in yourself. Have fun. And if you're feeling a little down or something, or someone's getting to you, call me. I love talking on the phone. And so, I have to say, if you've noticed like, a lot of this like, incredible media and all the touring and stuff that I do, these are all things that I truly never would have thought would be possible in my life. And so, my work with edible insects has truly led me to believe that anything is possible. And I'm not guaranteeing this is how you will feel by regularly eating insects, but I certainly welcome you to join me in trying one bug at a time. I'll go over the dishes uh, that we're serving here as well. Uh, you're welcome to get started, but we'll, we'll go over the dishes that we're serving, we're serving as well. So to go back over to that initial question that I asked, can eating insects save the planet? I will fearlessly put this out there with my conviction and passion and truly believing that it is an emphatic yes eating insects can indeed be a part of saving the planet. So a really big thank you to ACF and for all of you guys for attending uh, my presentation. I'm really so grateful to be able to share these ideas uh, here at the ACF National Convention. 
A uh, heartfelt thank to Jackie and Robert. I don't know if you guys know them, but they're a big part of organizing all the things here at the conference. If you haven't seen either of them, give them a hi and thank you. And uh, with that, I am happy to go over what you guys have on your plates and also uh, answer some questions that you guys may have. So uh, again, thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. And uh, all right, let's, uh, let's go over what we have here real quickly because I hear some munching going on. So we'll go over this and then I'm happy to answer some questions. Uh, this is a cricket gougere. We gougere is like little French cheese puffs and we substitute anywhere from like around 15% of the, the cricket, the flour with cricket powder. Cricket powder does not have gluten like flour, so you can't just substitute it, otherwise you won't get the, get the rise out of it. Uh, the brownies are, are uh, also made with cricket powder. This has a little bit more, about 20%, because we, we're not as reliant on the rise of uh, the gluten for brownies. And they also have mealworms. Uh, we put some of the mealworms off to the side as well, so you guys could, but their whole mealworms are also inside the brownie. But they have like a really pleasant, nutty sort of flavor that works exceptionally well with uh, dessert applications, but I also use them for a lot of savory applications as well. And we have some, uh, just some basic guacamole, and uh, the black ants again have formic acid, which give it a acidic sort of flavor profile, so that's why we added with like guacamole to, uh, you know, we, we really think that it's, it, it enhances the flavor of the food. And I actually think, I would encourage you guys, if you haven't eaten like the brownie or the gougere yet, give it a smell, because you know how smelling really informs you of flavor profiles, and uh, you might get a little hit and the, the smell of the cricket powder a better inform you of what what flavor you could expect from eating it. So, uh, all right, I'm happy to answer some questions. And uh, yes? Are there like ground up ants in the guacamole or is it just a garnish? No, I use it just as a garnish on top, just so you can see it. Um, I think I, is really good, that's why I asked. I think that in a, in, a, in a sense of like, if it was normal, maybe we would mix it in. But I, I actually really like how the black kind of pops out, kind of like caviar or black sesame seeds, but also serves a function of the flavor, a little bit of the texture, and so I, I actually like to kind of put it on top right now. Yes? So, um, Chef, um, I'm from Mexico, and we, I mean, you, on the street, they have like the big pails of the crickets and dusted in, you know, like chili powder and um, And the, I think it's like a snack, right? So yeah. Or something to that effect. Have you sourced something like this? The United States, and that, how do you buy the Yeah. So the question was on sourcing and, and purchasing of insects. I have great news for you. The majority of insects that you saw on the, during the slide presentation are all available online. Uh, we unfortunately, because of food safety and everything, they do come dehydrated or roasted or freeze dried. So we're not able to work with them as a fresh ingredient like in, in other parts of the world where, where they have like fresh insects that are available. Um, but I work exhaustively with the dried products because that's what's available to the rest of the world, uh, you know, to us really here. And so I work exhaustively with those products so that I can know whether or not I can actually, we can actually reliably work on it. And um, there are a lot of vendors that, that I rely on and trust, and, and they do a lot of the sourcing for me. Um, there's a very easy website, edibleinsects.com, uh, Enzo Center, they're great uh, sponsors of mine, and they, they provide a lot of the different insects. We have Entomo Farms that are a great uh, farm based up in Ontario that, that farm crickets. Three Cricketeers are uh, husband and wife that's based in the Midwest. If you want to support a Midwest uh, female owned and husband and wife company. Uh, so there are a lot of different options for uh, for where to where to get the edible insects. But nothing like Um or where do you get your life stuff? 
Well, for the, a lot of the live stuff that I work on, it, it's when I travel and I go to areas where, where those are more available. In the case of the cicadas, I went out and foraged all of them, but I'm not eating them live. Um, and generally, to avoid the risk of contaminants and pathogens and, and a risk, the human risk, uh, we rarely eat raw meat. I mean, maybe carpaccio or tartare or something. Uh, but we, we generally encourage people to, to cook their insects just for, for food safety. Uh, yes? Uh, when it comes to poisonous insects, how do you make sure that they're transferred in? Yeah. Uh, so the poison or venom inside the insects, uh, should you choose to eat a, you might have seen the tarantula that I had, or sort of a fair amount of scorpions as well, uh, that venom is denatured during the, the cooking process or the brining process, and that the heat is like really denatured that, that venom. And so that's, uh, and, and you know, I, I always serve my scorpions with the stinger attached, because hey, live a little, I served it to tens of thousands of people, no one got hurt, and if you want to take it off, I'm not going to give you a hard time, because we all have our own food preferences and like how we like to eat food, so I'm okay with however people choose to eat their food, but for the fun aspect of it, I always like to keep it on, because it's, it's way cooler to eat a scorpion with this tail, tail and sticker attached, in my opinion. Yes? Are there some insects, like, for example, a chicken where white meat, dark meat, Yeah, so the most commonly eaten insect in the world is the beetle, but it's the larvae of the beetle, and the mealworm that you guys ate, it's a misnomer, not a worm, it's a larvae. Now the superworm, the one that I pointed out to you guys earlier, I wish I had some samples to, to share with you guys, because it tastes like the burnt edge of grilled cheese, you know, and it's like really an intense cheesy flavor. And then like a, 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 a while I was doing a tasting with some chefs, they, someone took, took a little, just a little tiny bite off the tip. They're like, this doesn't taste cheesy. I'm like, get the F out of here. Of course it tastes cheesy. And what we realized, the tips don't taste cheesy and it's gastrointestinal tract in the middle that tastes cheesy. Um, when I cut open like a cicada nymph, it is amazing because it's full of all this white flesh. And most of us think of insects as like either dried or squishy. There's a lot of things that are in between, but the meatiness of so many of these insects that I've tried, it is really fascinating because they have a relatively mild flavor profile that take on a lot of the flavor that you cook it with. So if you cook it in like a lot of spicy sauces and, and like a soy spicy ginger sort of sauce, the insect's gonna take on a lot of those flavors. And so, um, but generally they're pretty small, so you're, you're generally eating the whole insect at the same time or ground into a powder. So um, I haven't eaten too many, I have but not too many insects where it's like, oh, let me break off the leg and and enjoy a chicken thigh or, or a cricket thigh or something like that. So, yeah. Yes? Uh, I saw a cricket aioli on your slide. Yeah. Is it is the cricket, because of the protein, able to emulsify with oil, or do you just add that powder in there to a, a base aioli to add flavor? Yeah, so I, yeah, that's exactly why I do it. I add it to tons of sauces. And it's so... The powder? Yeah, the, powder, the cricket powder, yeah. Is the cricket hot sauce too? Is it a little yeah, bit it has a powder. However, uh, chickens have chitin, the exoskeleton, which does not homogenize in, in liquid like water. So you need fat so that it'll be, so that it'll like um, homogenize with that. That's why it works in an aioli. But if you were just to try, like, because I tried adding cricket powder, I try to add cricket powder to virtually every single drink and or food that I've eaten in the past six years. Um, and what I've realized is that when I mix it up in coffee, I was like, oh cool, maybe I'll add a little nutty flavor like adding chicory to your coffee. And I mixed it in and you can drink it, it's a little sandy. If you let it sit, all the powder will fall down to the bottom. If you add a lot of cream, then it'll suspend itself a little bit better. 
but generally uh, you need something that's, that, that can hold, the, uh, hold it a little better. So. Uh, there are Cricut hydrolysates. Uh, hydrolysates you guys may be most familiar with when you have like soy or pea protein. You use hydrolysates to extract and, and create that, that powder. Uh, there are some scientists that I know that, that create Cricut hydrolysates for me. Um, it's not available in the market, but by removing the, the, the exoskeleton and the fat, we have something that's a little more, that, that's a little more soluble and better for food manipulation. So, um, yeah, but maybe that will be available as we, we see a, a bigger growth in the, in the interest of what we're doing right now. Uh, yes? Not, not very much, because at the end of the day, we're, we're only uh, subbing about 10%, right? It was like 12% 12, 12% cricket powder and spread out between all of it. It's more, and, and again, like if you, it's not about all the things where just because we're eating insects, it doesn't have to fulfill that protein sort of requirement, but two tablespoons of cricket powder have 13 to 15 grams of protein. Most of us in here need about 50, 60 grams of protein a day. So four tablespoons in one meal will give you the, the protein requirement for an adult. So if you're looking at it from a nutritional standpoint, that's not bad, four tablespoons. I can make that stand out as the main flavor, or if I, if I cook it with a lot of aromatics, I can really hide that flavor as well. So it's like incredibly versatile what we can do with insect protein. And so um, if you want to, if you know someone that's like, I don't know about it, you want to kind of hide it a little bit more, uh, that's, that's really easy to do with like aromatics and stuff as well. Uh, yes? Yeah, are there any insects you've tried that you just couldn't stomach? Uh, are there any insects that I couldn't stomach? I don't want to answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I was just in uh, Bangkok and I go out on the street you know the first insect I see, I'm gonna try it. And it was a, a black scorpion on a steak. It's like what you see a lot in, when people go to Thailand, you have these vet, street vendors that are selling them. And um, to be honest with you, the way that it was prepared, it took me like a minute to chew the, the claw and the chitin and everything. And to me, it's just like, it's more gimmicky than like a true way to enjoy it. The, the body was a little softer and a little easier to eat, and the tail was like really easy to eat. But when, when things get difficult like that, and there's the enjoyment of eating it isn't there, to me, it's like, okay, it's, I, I'm definitely gonna do it at least one time. But that's like an example where like, will I eat another one? Maybe if I knew it was prepared differently where the chitin wasn't like cooked so that it's like really brittle, like harder than hard candy to chew through. Um, I've eaten chantakudos, which are palm weevils, like the size of your thumb. They live in palm trees, and they're really juicy. And when I was in the Amazon, in Sariaku in the Amazon, um, some of them were eating it alive. And so I was like, all right, let me make a little uh, ceviche out of it. And so I took a lot of the local herbs and spices. I, I made a little Asian style, like with soy, made a ceviche out of it. And I, I did eat that live, uh, but again, I generally try to avoid eating live. But that was a really pleasant eating experience. So to have, if you think about palm and the similarity to coconut, it's a really sweet flavor, and it's like really, really pleasant to eat the uh, palm noodles as well. Uh, yes? Yeah, is there any concern with any allergens, human allergens, as far as eating insects? You know what? I actually <laughs> did a big, I, I need to give you guys an allergen warning, actually. Um, excuse me, but for the <laughs> Okay, you know what, that's totally my fault. And I usually have a menu that, that has, and, and the amount that you ate is so little and no one seems to be going to an anaphylactic shop or anything, thank you. Um, but the, the big thing is this, is that as we said before, insects are arthropods, just like shellfish. And so if you have a, a sensitivity towards shellfish, you may have a sensitivity towards insects. And you probably know somebody that's just allergic to crabs, but not shrimp. 
And so it's not like, oh, you're allergic to shellfish, you're allergic to insects. Because I, one of my, one of my closest friends, he's only allergic to mealworms. So when I know he's coming, like you would have had mealworms in this meal if I knew he was going to come. Uh, and so there are people with allergies just to one, one type of insect as well. But out of an abundance of, of cautiousness, uh, forgive me for not, not giving you that in advance. Um, but that, that generally is like the sensitivity warning that, that we do give to people. Yes? Um, in your, like, your vision for your company as, as chefs, I mean, we know we find a certain percentage of bugs in flour, per se. Yeah. Would you envision your, your company maybe giving a, a more of a push as a fortifier? Like if flour already came with a, a little bit more of the, of, of the <coughs> bugs, like powdered flour, or yeah. more, more utilizing it as its raw form, not raw form, but its, its whole form? Uh, again, this is like calculus, not arithmetic. So it's like all the things. That's why like, I, I, don't, I, I don't have like a consumer packaged good where I'm like, <laughs> This is the next insect product. And, and I also kind of avoided that, the, the trappings for that because I truly want to be an ambassador selling thought leadership ideas, not a product. Like, hey, buy this cricket powder. It's like amazing, it's my product, whatever. Uh, I, do, I do support all my sponsors and like would love for you guys to support the, the industry and buy it. Um, we do have like different flower products that have cricket powder mixed into it. And you know there is no one thing or one silver bullet. There's no one big type of food that's going to change everyone's opinion and everything. And really, for me, it's like consistency and really making as many of these products available. And so I think that question of the cart, the cart before the horse. It's really making these things sort of available so that people can experiment with it. And really, for a lot of young entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs, go out and be like. I love these ants. All right, I'll give, I'll give you one. One of you guys could take this and put it out to the market. Black ant salt is a money maker. Um, black ant salt, put it in the bank. You get your nice like kosher salt or sea salt and mix it up with ants. Uh, it is a magic, magical salt. I made a uh, black ant compound butter and I, the reactions that I get from people sometimes on these type of foods it is just staggering because they never thought that insects can taste and really truly functionally enhance the flavor of, of the food that we've come so accustomed to. And so that, that, that'll be really interesting. That's what I was really excited about to share with you guys because I would love if one of you guys became a millionaire selling some insect products. I won't even ask for a commission. I'll be like, hey, let me, uh, you know, maybe I'll ask for some free samples so I can like share, share the goods. But you know, this is really the function of what, what I believe in deep down in my heart. I do need to diversify my revenue streams and everything. Um, and I need to make income to, to have this be sustainable. But I, I really do, if you guys have questions and you're like, Hey, I worked six years cooking with insects. If I could streamline some of this research for you so you're not like going through all the same notes and like, okay, what does baking, crickets, frying it, roasting it, blanching it, what do all these things do for the, towards the flavor and texture of the food? Ask me, and I'm, I'm more than happy to share all this. There's tons of science papers. If any of you guys are into reading science papers, uh, there's tons of science papers about the science behind eating insects and, and insect agriculture as well. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions? Have you ever thought about putting out like a reference book with different types of edible insects and how to cook them, or like a recipe book to make it more accessible? Yeah, th so there are a lot of references that are out there. The FAO report that I, that I posted earlier, it was downloaded a million times overnight in 2013. That's pretty amazing, 2013. Uh, it's been downloaded like seven and a half million times subsequently. Um, it has a lot of really great information in there. And there are other resources available. I would love to write my first book. Um, I've received some offers. Um, I need to, it, it hasn't been the right one yet. Uh, I need to, I, I'm really so busy. I've, I've traveled a third of this year so far, and um, it, it's, uh, I need to try to find time to, 
to, to hopefully write a book on these things. Uh, yes? Have you ever taken a yearly powder and make it work in the Oh, okay. So one thing that I was saying before about cricket powder sinking down at the bottom or being kind of sandy, not a very pleasant mouthfeel in cocktails. Uh, however, I, I did write an article about uh, the functionality of insects uh, in cocktails, as it were. What you can do is infuse it with whole crickets inside your whiskey, for example. I know one of you guys will have the answer to this. What do you think happens when you infuse cricket powder into your whiskey? Anybody? What happens when you add protein to your cocktails, like an egg white in your pisco sour? You get that frothy top when you shake it up, right? Same thing happens when you uh, infuse crickets to your whiskey. The black ants with that formic acid has this mystical flavor. So incredible when you infuse that with gin. Think about all the aromatics and beautiful flavors in gin. You could also take this one and, and bring it to your bar or establishments. Um, you think about agave worms, what are, what are found inside tequila and mezcal bottles. Having agave salt to bring, to bring, bring your drinks like that. There are really so many beautiful ways. Thus far, I found that infusing, I actually have some vesicular flavors up with our Japanese whiskey that's uh, been infusing in sake for over a year right now. I kind of take little sips here and now and again, kind of uh, enjoy it. Uh, but that lens is incredible. Okay, insects have a beginning flavor, middle flavor, and an ending flavor more than regular sorts of food. And the vesicular flavor set starts a little mildly sweet, but not cloyingly sweet. And it finishes with this really fascinating mineral minerality, or like almost a metallic flavor, like towards the end. And when you add that and infuse it into whiskey, it is so discernible and so incredible to add that type of flavor into uh, into your cocktails. And what I did after, because I you infuse the vesicular flavor stuff in the sake, you drink it all. Most people aren't going to be like, let me just keep like a mouthful of like vesicular flavor stuff since like they've been infused. So what did I do? My friend's like, we should candy that, Joseph. I'm like, we should candy that. Put some egg whites, some, some sugar, candied it, dried it up, and it is so beautiful. That je ne sais quoi of being able to add that kind of flavor that you can't find anywhere else. You want to stand out and create some flavors that people will be like, how the F did you create that flavor, Chef? And it's nutrient dense and sustainable and smart and delicious. Um, I, I really don't know what, what the holdup is with insects, particularly because their farms are harvested specifically for human consumption. And it's not like we're eating a bug that flies into our salad, right? That's gross. We're not we're not eating, we're not talking about the undesirable bug parts that the FDA allows in our ketchup and coffee and chocolate and stuff, right? I mean, we're talking about the intentional use of it, and that's really important to emphasize when people are like, Joseph, look, I got a fly in my salad. I should eat it, right? And I'm like, no, you're, you're missing the entire point if you think that's what I'm, if you think that's what I'm trying, to, trying to get you to do, because that's kind of gross, and I always discard random insects that, fly, that might fly into my food. Uh, did you have your hand up? Yeah. yeah. Yes, there actually are cricket beers in uh, in Quebec, and it's really interesting because that flavor is so prevalent. Um, the one that I tried was a little assertively crickety, but I think that a lot of times people want that flavor to stand out because it's so relatively new. And you know, if you think about how many of you guys like garlic, yeah, I love garlic. And imagine if you've never tried garlic and your friend's like, I love garlic. And you're like, ah, 
you just like pop a raw pub in your mouth and your friend told you it was really good. And you're like, ah, oh, the salt and sulfuric acid taste it. Like, that's disgusting. Your friend's like, no, you gotta learn how to cook with it. Like bring out the natural sugars and roast it. I, I feel like we're kind of at the stage of eating raw garlic in, in, in America with regards to eating insects. And so it's like learning how to apply it into food because it could be the star of the dish or it could be like an additive to, to a dish. And so it's like all those things and that's like a really big thing that I try to emphasize and encourage is that there are so many gastronomical applications with it. We're, the only limitation really is with our imagination. Uh, yes? Does the, does the insertion of the insects into standard dishes, does that affect shelf life, cervical life of foods in any way? Um, what, what kind, what like for? So say you're using supplemental cricket flour in items that traditionally have a three day cervical life to them. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. that cricket flour going to affect, say, cervical life of an item, shelf life of an item? We have found that cricket powder, I, I like to say powder because flour is a little bit of misleading. And the cricket powder generally does not affect the shelf life if I add it to like, I, I call it a, a cricket bolognese or ragu. People are like, Joseph, there's no meat in there. You can't call it that. I'm like, yes, I can. I mean, the cricket's like, you know, what, what I'm using as a substitute to playfully call it a ragu. Um, there's no, on the shelf life, it, it doesn't really affect it. Sometimes the crickets and cricket powder, they, they might have like a half year or one year sort of um, shelf life. The flavor definitely decreases, and for those of like an extremely great palate, you might detect a little bit of rancid, rancidness starting to develop, but I've eaten insect products I've had for like three, four years, just as a, someone's gotta do the research. And so um, I, I've generally found that it just kind of like decreases in the intensity of the flavor. Some of it starts tasting just a little sawdusty, like kind of bland in flavor. Um, but generally, I found that most of them really hold really well. Right, are there uh, any other questions? Yes? So is it regulated, is production of the, the insect regulated by the USDA? Okay. For farming, in application to edible version? Yeah, so a lot of the farms that I work with have passive uh, you know, in, in place, um, and the FDA has, has this as the overarching guideline for, uh, for American food. If something is uh, reared for the purpose of human consumption, it's processed at an FDA-approved facility, and the scientific name is labeled on the packaging, then it's deemed as food in America. That does not give the confidence to the big food purveyors to put in tens of millions of dollars to like develop this sort of product and put it on market yet. So a big part that we're, we're also trying to work in policy and legislation to create more confidence among uh, in our you know in the policies. And imagine if we had like incentives in place for cricket farmers, uh, you know, through the USDA and different grants that they have. So we're, we're really working to try to emphasize and, and advocate for these sort of things. Um, but a, a lot of the food products that are re for in America, uh, they, they are kind of following a lot of these processes that, uh, to be FDA approved and stuff like that. So with the FDA and USDA all aboard of that, so it never should be an issue with like a local health or state authority? Correct, yeah. I've, I, I definitely get a lot of scrutiny when I go to universities because uh, the last thing that they want is one of their students to get sick and have to deal with a lawsuit or anything. So I, I work regularly with the sanitarium, sanitarium officers and, and different people to ensure that the products that we're bringing in is safe, usually by like giving like FDA registration numbers of vendors I work with and stuff like that as well. So the next one would be, yeah. is there a temperature, is there a temperature, um, like we have with all of our regular meats. Say if you use it in a baking application or as a stir fry, or what, it doesn't have to go to a certain temperature, or because it is a dehydrated product or dried product, it's, 
because you know where it comes A? Yeah, because, exactly what you said, because it is processed generally when we get it. Um, I do get frozen products, so I can like R&D for companies I work with and stuff. Um, but generally, everything that you get is going to be processed and ready to eat. And unfortunately, we lose a little bit because we lose a lot of the, the body and the texture and mouthfeel like the fresh insects where fresh crickets, they like kind of pop in your mouth and they, they, they have a lot more body than when they're dehydrated. But for now, it's, you know, that it's like a product that's reliably, reliably available in America. And so, that, so I do work extensively with that so that I can kind of share the work that I do and not have it be like, oh, you're doing that because you can get this special product. I really work with the product that, that's available just so that I can kind of share that work and, and have people like try to, um, you know, recreate the, the recipes that they, they want as well. So then where is the best where is the best purveyor to research or get product from? Um, I, I have product available, um, kind of as a white label, but edibleinsects.com is like really great. To uh, they're, they're incredibly reliable. Entomo Farms, uh, Three Cricketeers, they're, they're among my, my more reliable vendors here in, in, uh, in America. Uh, does anyone else have any uh, questions? I, I really appreciate this robust uh, Q and A, and generally, I would say there there are a lot of questions, um, and I and I am really happy to answer this offline, or I'm here until Thursday. And uh, if you see me, feel free to grab me and ask me questions. Uh, but before we end it all, uh, did anyone have any last questions at all? What is your favorite insect to eat? Oh, that whole right now. Oh, I think the. The girl last that, that asked that before, unfortunately. But um, I would say my favorite all-time insect to eat. I mean, there are so many. It's like, what's your favorite meat? It's kind of hard to answer. But uh, for me, I, I would say that the cicada is is my favorite. Uh, my work with cicadas like really changed my life, and uh, they're really incredible, both the nymph and the adult. They have just beautiful textures and flavors and and it really is like a very special uh, insect that I've worked with and I really enjoy eating and sharing with people as well. The black ants are, are really good. Scorpions, they're like little brine baby shrimp almost. It's really fascinating. Grasshoppers, a lot of them come flavored. They have a little more chew and mouthfeel to it than crickets do. And so uh, I love grasshoppers. Uh, the mealworms, super easy to eat and like really like kind of like snacks. Snacking style food. Um, there, there's really so many, and uh, yeah, super fun to, to just kind of keep working with, with insects. Okay, well, I am so grateful for you guys for, for joining the presentation, and so a really big thank you all for coming. And uh, yeah.